Well, hello again everybody. Well, you can see on the bench again today we've got this Lafayette radio because it does appear that a lot of you did quite enjoy looking at this radio and you left plenty of comments so I thought we could uh, we could carry on with it and uh, see if we can actually start to improve things. Now, I think last time we actually just managed to run the radio up and we did actually manage to tune in some stations but we had quite a problem with... Uh, mains hum now i haven't touched it since so let's just go ahead and just verify that so let's switch the power on okay so as you can see we've got mains hum now because i'm used to working on radios and stuff like that i can tell by the tone of that interference that's 50 hertz that's the frequency that is 50 hertz so that's the incoming mains can you hear that now the reason that I mention that is because this radio has been implemented with a full wave rectifier so if this hum was coming from the smoothing capacitors because of course that's what everybody says they always say well you need to change out the main smoothing capacitors well that isn't the case and I can very easily identify that because if this was a ripple problem with the smoothing capacitors the frequency of this hum would be at 100 hertz and that isn't that's 50 hertz so this is direct pickup of the mains. Now there is quite a few places where this 50 hertz could be coming in. It could just be down to really bad wiring and the wiring inside this has been hacked. Uh, a lot of the grounds have been disconnected and stuff like that. So that's an atrocious condition. The other place that we can pick up mains hum is, uh, is up here. We've actually got valves which have got AC heaters in them. So we can actually pick up in some cases we can pick up hum from inside the valve itself which is AC we can also directly pick up hum from we've got a mains transformer here and it's actually installed relatively close to the output speaker and the output transformer and again so it's not uncommon to get direct coupling between the magnetic flux in a transformer here and also an, uh, and it'll directly couple into the speaker itself and into the output transformer. Uh, and just generally everything's quite untidy in this radio, quite a lot of poor grounds and stuff like that. So I thought we could actually go poking around and see if we can, uh, we can see or find some of these sources of home. So let me just switch this off. I think I really should make some plastic covers for some of these parts. There's an awful lot of... Uh, live components and things that I could very easily stick my fingers on. Non least is the incoming mains here on this blue and this brown wire. So they're at 230 volts. Uh, I'm not plugged in on the isolation transformer, maybe that's a bit silly so I think we will actually swap that over to the isolation transformer because that's a bit safer isn't it? Now we do have to be very careful working in this radio chassis. As I say it's not a live chassis but it's been considerably kind of hacked at and uh, like most valve radios the electrical safety is a little bit dubious at the best of the time so we've also got live wiring on the back of the uh, the volume control pot now I actually mentioned that in particular because this is one of the places where we can get mains hum induced and the reason we get mains hum induced or we can get it induced into volume controls is well this is a switch volume control it actually switches the live incoming main so we've got very high voltage AC here which is carrying voltage and current of course and it's physically very very close to the wiper on the potentiometer here of the volume control now of course a valve radio is, has got a very very high input so it's very very sensitive to uh, electrical fields and capacitance and uh, we can get pick up between one part of the circuit and another so my favorite place to go whenever I'm looking for uh, humming radios is it's tone controls I always like to have a look at but the main culprit can often be volume controls normally um, we've got a, a metal cladded pot here well this should actually be grounded at the moment it's actually just floating and it's picking up the AC mains and uh, it's coupling it into the output of the uh, amplifier valve into the grid so I can just demonstrate that I mean there's many more sources of hum but you've got to grab the low angering fruit first haven't you so again let's just switch on this yellow clip lead here we're going to clip that onto the uh, chassis which is ground and I'm just going to touch this to the side of our potentiometer here our volume control pot
and hopefully you can hear that most of the hum immediately disappears. For all the wiring in this part of the uh, radio circuit it's just really really dodgy looking it's really poor so I think the first part of the restoration that we're going to do is before we do go diving in and changing things out like the main smoothing capacitors that may be fine I think we're going to try and sort out some of the wiring around this uh, this audio section of the circuit because it, it's in a poor state it really is we can see that effectively we've got this uh, We've got this wire which I've just noticed is all burnt and manky. Well that's feeding one of the dial lamps. Uh, so that's pretty much frayed through and shorting out. In fact, I could see what looks like a little bit of a burn mark on the chassis here. So I suspect at some point maybe it has got hot and melted. So that, that really wants sorting out. But really I can see that the actual grounding of this pot, well, they haven't grounded the body on it and that's a problem. But even the other ground connections, well, oh well, Oh, that's no good, is it? I've just noticed there's one of them. <laughs> it's actually just fallen off. So there we go. One of the one of the actual connections which should be made to the body of this potentiometer. It's uh, it's not even connected to the tag strip, so that's not very good. It is connected down here somewhere, kind of almost out of shot. But the problem is, this is a long length of wire. Ground connections, you want to actually minimise them. They need to be as short as possible. So I think the easiest thing to do is, I think we need to just take this potentiometer out. And I think what I'm going to do is, we've got them big soldering irons now. I think what I'm going to do is, I'm going to clean the chassis up. And I'm actually going to solder onto the side of the chassis here. And I'm going to put a, a piece of wire on. And we're going to actually directly ground out our pot here we're going to ground it to the chassis rather than having these long convoluted um, sections here because uh, yeah that's that's just useless it's no good whatsoever rather than having a grub screw you actually have to take a plastic cap off the front of here and undo this with a wide flat blade so let me have a go at that this is actually a very nice way of um, removing a knob that it does come off very nicely much much an easier way of doing it than you know fiddling with uh, you know horrible little grub screws that always seize up well as you can see this wire in here is just a total uh, mess it's just a bodge so we desperately need to sort this out don't we maybe we can have a go at addressing how crusty this pot is because i think i said before it was the uh, the stiffest pot i think i've ever found so i think we'll have a go at giving this thing a damn good clean while it's out Well, although it's only a few moments for you, it's actually a few days later now for me. Well, as you can see, I've actually gone ahead and we've replaced our volume and our on and off mains power switch here. And uh, to be honest, the job really didn't go as expected. And uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get it on film. But basically what happened is I installed this switch. Now, this switch looks a bit hacked. But um, this was actually what I think is a pretty brand new switch when we started. So I installed it in here and we wired it all up and I found that the radio was um, totally dead. I mean it was getting the AC mains and we had HT but I, I wasn't actually getting any volume out of it. And uh, it actually took me a little while to figure out what was going on. Um, it actually took me longer than it should have done. So this is the original potentiometer which I actually removed. Well, I say it's the original, but it isn't because this one is actually branded radio spare. So this is an RS component part. And uh, I actually think that just looking at the style of this uh, potentiometer, it's considerably older than this uh, Lafayette radio is. So when, when all the other hackery went on inside here, somebody changed out this uh, potentiometer. Now the original potentiometer that was installed in the Lafayette radio would have been 1 megohm, but this one is 0.25 megohm, so really, really quite a lot different. Uh, one thing you can see is, uh, and I, I suspect the reason the person used this is because it has a very long, shaft on it and uh, you actually need a very long shaft for it to reach through to the front of the radio. Now unfortunately the replacement that I've put in its place didn't have a long shaft so uh, well I fitted an all-important shaft extension so I'm sure you'll be glad to know that. But going back this is the uh, this is the the potentiometer which I first of all tried and as I said earlier it was actually a new one but it had gone it had gone open circuit. Let me see if I can bring you in a little bit closer.
So what had gone wrong with the original potentiometer that I tried is this connection here had gone open circuit and it just so happens that this was the uh, the output from the detector stage. So it was taking our very low level output and then I think the uh, the wiper connection here, the centre one, this was going to the uh, the input of the pento and output stage. So this was being amplified and uh, and then this end of course was, was at earth potentially, it was grounded. So of course although I'd got the wire connected from the detector it wasn't actually getting in, it wasn't getting through this variable resistance but it was a really tedious fault because um, I say that it had gone open circuit, it was going intermittently open circuit and it really seemed to depend a lot on uh, you know how it was tightened down when you actually tighten it down into the radio it must somehow have been stressing the body and that's when it went open circuit but when I actually took it out repeatedly and measured it from end to end it was measuring one mega ohm so it was just really intermittent and uh, I've got to say I spent quite a long time trying to chase my tail getting to the bottom of it, it you know it wasn't obvious to me well, as you can see I've got a new meter on the bench and now this is a Fluke 25 meter and I say it's a new meter it's actually uh, it's actually a, quite an old meter now but this type of meter was uh, recommended to me by Andrew Ausfuffer and uh, I've got to admit I am really quite uh, pleased with it it is built like a, a proverbial brick dunny as they say isn't it so I've gone ahead and I've, uh, I've connected up the terminals of our potentiometer and uh, well you can just see there that we're not getting constant readings are we it's uh, it's all over the shop he said as it gives constant readings and th and that was my problem basically it would work for a while and then it would just go completely haywire of course sod's law it's behaving itself at the moment but I I'm not lying to you I promise you it's bad and as you can see the new potentiometer that I've installed has got a pair of uh, double switch contacts on the back of it so we are now doing double pole switching I've also re renewed the wiring up to the transformer and tried to neaten that a little bit and uh, I've also gone ahead and I've actually replaced the two capacitors which is a grid coupling capacitor here, a yellow one at the back and also a tone capacitor here and uh, I decided to go ahead and replace them really because I just happened to be in there and I had to disconnect some of the wiring I did actually test the old capacitors and I have to say that there weren't, really wasn't anything wrong with them but they'd been replaced anyway and again because we were messing around with the mains I've gone ahead and I've installed a tough rubber type trailing cable so the uh, the radio's got a nice cable on it again a rubber cable and the chassis has now been earthed now before I actually call this job done I've got some more work to do on this radio you can probably see that this uh, this volume knob it's all a bit wibbly wobbly and that's because again the previous owner where the actual shaft came through the front of the radio it used to go through a hole but for some reason they decided to uh, ream that hole out well I say reamer I think they probably used a uh, I don't know, a blunt rusty chisel to bash a hole in and uh, it's kind of all shaped. So unfortunately because such a large hole has been drilled in the front of the radio the actual shaft on the potentiometer it's just wallowing around and uh, that isn't actually helped because it's a nylon shaft on the potentiometer and I fitted a brass shaft extension so what I think we're actually going to do is um, is fit a support bush at the front of here because I'm sure you'll agree there's really there's nothing better than putting your shaft into a nice bush is there so we'll go ahead and do that so I'm hoping now we've replaced that volume pot that we should have reduced a little bit of the uh, the mains hum because a lot of the hum was coming from the back, fact that the body of it wasn't correctly grounded and uh, I've corrected that when I've replaced it so let's switch on Metaphor written on the side. <laughs> beep, beep, beep. 
Now one of the benefits seems to be from changing this variable resistor out from the 250 kilo ohms that it was to put the correct 1 mega ohm part, the actual volume of the radio has come up a little bit and I'm guessing that's because the earthy end of the track when it was 250k it was actually pulling this, the signal down from the detector a little bit more so we've actually had an increase in volume and, and that kind of gives the uh, illusion that the radio has suddenly become more sensitive because now it's actually louder we can actually hear some stations that we couldn't hear before because we can turn the volume up a little bit more so that's been a little bit of a double win so what I think I might tackle next is some of the uh, wiring to the heaters of the valves because again none of this is original because it's been changed from a series string arrangement because that's what the original valves were in here to a parallel arrangement but they're actually using the uh, the chassis as the return for the valve filament heaters but the way they were actually using the chassis as the return they were actually uh, kind of going through a lot of the other components which would be sensitive to mains hum on them so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do some rewiring of this and the transformer the 6.3 volts it comes in kind of at this side and it goes to that valve that valve that valve and then there's a long length of wire which comes all the way back to this valve over here the more wiring the more AC wiring we have in here the more mains pickup that we're going to have so I'm going to try to uh, I'm going to rewire this now and uh, try to tidy it up uh, also we've got a mismatch of wire colors and a lot of the wires has been burnt so, you know whenever it was installed somebody didn't do a very good job of a sword and iron so yeah we're just going to carry on with general tidying up and uh, then once we've done the general tidying up I think we might address some of this capacitor issue and also some of the power supply section as I say it's difficult to see the wood for the trees the original circuit diagram especially around the power supply doesn't really bear any resemblance to what we've got here it's just been so hacked so we've got to we've got to we've got to go back into the long grass and we've got to hack some of it down to get it back to uh, get it back to where we want it I think so we need to do some soldering on the chassis to get these good connections to the filament heaters and uh, I don't even remember the last time we used this soldering iron this 100 watt Antex iron it was getting far too hot in fact the flux was actually setting on fire it was burning when we actually tried to flux the iron so that was too hot so what I did in the last video to actually try to control the temperature I actually ran the soldering iron using my Variac transformer but unfortunately of course the Variac takes up a lot of room on the desk so instead I've actually got one of these 13 amp plug-in dimmers I think it says 13 amps but I don't think they've got 13 amp capacity they just mean that it fits a 13 amp plug here in the UK yeah I'm pretty sure they're not 13 amp capacitor does it actually say the wattage oh yeah some the wattage is from 40 to uh, 280 watts so it's probably a little bit misleading when they've got 13 amps so yeah be careful make sure you know what you're buying so this is just a lamp dimmer the sort of thing you use for uh, controlling the brightness of the uh, filament lamps and stuff like that I suppose that's why they call it a lamp dimmer pretty obvious well I'm hoping we can actually use that to actually turn down the uh, temperature of the soldering iron a little bit now of course it doesn't make the soldering iron regulated it just means we're going to supply a little bit more power to it uh, sorry a little bit less power to it so in theory it's not going to get quite so hot now for anybody who's got a similar problem with the soldering iron assuming that it's not a temperature controlled iron you could go ahead and buy one of these from memory they're about eight pounds on Amazon they're about the cheapest thing I could find to be honest so let's see it will either work or it will explode so I'm going to turn it full up first and I'm going to back it down a bit just guessing let's see how we go with that Okay, I'm fairly happy I've got that. I'm actually turning my soldering iron up a little bit on my lamp dimmer. I think it was a little bit cool there. Um, but that's much better. The flux isn't burning off. It's, uh, it's got really bright and it's also shiny. It's also shiny on the end of the soldering iron. I don't even remember it was just a horrible burnt mess on the end of here last time. So it looks like our little lamp dimmer plug is doing its job. So that's, that's good, isn't it? So 
Okay, that's our connection to the uh, chassis made. So that'll be one end of the filament. So now we can go ahead and connect the actual uh, other side of the filament, the other side of the heater. Now I think I'm going to give this radio a test at that because there's quite a lot of uh, earths here. They're all joined onto one of these valve tags and uh, I'm going to say it looks like a total dog's dick and I do want to sort that out but I think because that's quite a major connection I think we need to go away and just do some retesting so let's uh, tidy up a little bit we'll plug the radio back in and we'll see if all these other valve heaters are lighting up and uh, check we're still good Seconds, which is plenty of time to run the 400 meters. So that's okay, still working. Well, maybe you can see I've gone ahead and I've taken both the dial lamps out of the uh, Lafayette radio. And just looking at this one, for example, you can see that it almost looks like a mirror finish on the uh, glass dome. So when you see bulbs that look like this, what it actually means is they've been overrunning voltage, they've had too much voltage going across them. Because what's happened is they've got a tungsten filament, and that tungsten metal has got so hot it's actually. It's actually evaporated from the filament and it's actually uh, settled out on the inside. It's condensed, if you like. It's condensed on the inside of the glass bulb. And uh, that's why it looks a lot like a, a mirror finish, why it's reflective. So these bulbs have been overrun. So just looking at the voltage rating of these bulbs, these are actually both 3.5 volt bulbs, but they're actually being run from a 6.3 volt supply. So yeah, there's your problem. <laughs> Well, I think the next little job that we're going to tackle, for no reason than it's annoying me, is this baker -like, uh, broken Bakelite antenna connector here. So it's obviously been bashed at some point and it's snapped in half. Now, I do have some of this baker -like material, but what I decided to do, again, just for quickness really, is uh, I've gone ahead and I've actually just 3D printed a little bracket to take the antenna connector. So it's, you know, it's not exactly original, but... Um, I think it's uh, it's better than spending a lot of you know time in the garage and uh, making another one. Looks as though the uh, actual tag on the back of this switch has already been damaged by somebody in the past and I don't want it breaking off because uh, hard things to repair these selector switches if they get damaged. Gives it just a little bit of strain relief that doesn't it. So I've just gone ahead and I've put a new bridge rectifier in the on the top of the transformer here which is where the old one was soldered and the reason that I've replaced that is simply because I didn't know what it was so the one that I've got now has got a thousand volt uh, peak reverse rating so that's probably better because at least I know what it is and uh, I've just got to reconnect now the red wire which is going to be the HT and we've also got to connect the uh, the filament supply and you probably can't see it but I've also replaced uh, the grounding strap because it was a very thin piece of wire which was going down to the chassis of the radio and it was actually just tagged on to this uh, this earth wire down here which is grounding the variable capacitor so uh, rather than grounding off the variable capacitor what I've done is I've, uh, I've took one of the bolts out of the chassis and I've put a big heavy crimp terminal lug on it so I'm hoping that that's going to provide a, a better ground and all these things actually help to reduce the amount of hum that you get on a radio. Now I also thought we were just getting a, a hint of modulation hum and maybe RF instability so this radio would have had an RF bypass capacitor fitted across the main supply well it didn't when we got to it but I've, I've fitted one of these uh, reefer safety capacitors so uh, that's got one installed now it probably won't make any difference but it's shown on the diagram so we've put one in well it's a bit of a rat's nest in here isn't it and I was also getting a little bit bored with uh, shocking myself on this uh, on the top of this transformer so we've just gone ahead and we've, uh, we've 3d printed a cover which in theory should just clip onto here, it might need the help of a little bit of glue. 
Is that going to go on? Yes, I think that's... Oh, well, okay. Might need a little bit of help to stay on that. And it's got a little bit of a notch cut out of one side, just let the pulley wheel go through. So now when I touch the top of this transformer, hopefully I won't get a shock and does the little wheel pass? Yeah, it does. Well, that does seem to be working, doesn't it? Well, I'm going to call it a day for today. Next time, I think we'll take a look at maybe some of the main smoothing capacitors. We're going to take a look at this meter, see if there is anything we can do with it. Probably not, but we will have a go. And we've got to wire up this phone socket. And uh, then I think we're probably on the home run. So we'll just have to realign it and we'll call it done. But for today, that will definitely do. So until next time, as always, thanks for watching, but bye-bye for now. Mm -hmm.